Good to see each one of you this morning. Trust that everyone is doing well. Uh, before we do begin, I want to—I forgot to thank y'all last week for the fine meal and the kindness and the hospitality that you showed my daughters and myself. And I want to say thank you. I'm terrible with names. I've got a few of yours down, but don't be alarmed if I keep asking you what's your name. Kind of a small world. They live in Weatherford, Texas, and I lived there for five years. If my parents were still alive, my dad would be 90, and mom, my mom would be 86, and they grew up in Weatherford. And they knew where my grandparents had a flower shop, and she'd heard of it, and so it's kind of a small world. I think, Lord willing, I'm scheduled to be in Poolville next year, if I'm not mistaken, or pairing one of the two somewhere in that area if all goes well I've already got a few appointments scheduled for next year and several of others here you know many people that I know of and that I've met I think I might be going in the witness protection program because there's no telling what kind of stories they might have about me what's ironic is I got a brother who's also a preacher not only did I do full-time work for 15 years, but I got a brother who's a preacher. And a lot of times I'll go to a place and they'll say, oh, you must be Eddie's brother. Or what's real funny is my oldest brother, see, I grew up in a family of nine kids. My oldest brother is an elder, and I'll run into somebody visiting the congregation. Oh, you must be Tom uh, Jr.'s brother, which I am. And I'm thinking, I hope they don't tell my brothers any stories about me because I might be a dead man the next time I see them. But we have that brotherly love with each other. And then once in a while, I'll meet somebody who knew my parents in South Texas. So it's kind of a small world. You never meet a stranger, as the old saying goes. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Second Kings, and we'll get into chapter 22 in just a little bit. I filled in not long ago at Corsicana, and some young man comes up to me and says, I've been preaching for 25 years. He says, I like your preaching. My grandfather has heard you ever since he was a little boy, and I've only been preaching 25 years, not 40-something years like he thought I had. I know i got gray hair, but I'm not that old, and some had thought I was. Before we begin, let's go to the Father in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the blessings you've given us. Father, we're so thankful that we can take your word and that we can study from it. We're thankful for these men of old who did live up to your standard. We're thankful for the example that they showed us of how we should conduct ourselves. But we're thankful for the greatest example of all, and that's your son, who came in this world to save us so that we could have a hope, so that we could have pardon, so that we could have redemption of sin and so that we could have forgiveness of sins. Things that we do not deserve, dear God, but out of your love and compassion you provided them because of his death. Help us to not take those things for granted. Father, we pray that this worship service will be pleasing to you. Help us to learn more about your word. Help us on our journey while we're here on this earth to understand that our purpose should be to see others and to seek you and put you first, but to help others reach heaven as well. In your son's name, amen. Remember last week, I said I had a special lesson for some of the younger people. Well, the lesson can go for some of us older people too. And that's why I'm going to title it, Lessons That We Learn From a Youngster, from Second Kings chapter 22 and chapter 23. We like heroes, don't we? I'm going to let you know something. No matter what age you are, the person that we're going to talk about this morning can be a hero to you. No matter if you're a girl or a boy, here's a hero to you that we can learn from. A guy by the name of King Josiah who becomes king at eight years old. We think that's in a relatively young age, and it is. 
But I do believe a statement that I heard one time. And the more I'm around small children, the more I believe it to be true. It has been said by somebody, in every nation on this earth, let a small child rule that country for a day. And that de- during that day, guess what? There would not be any fighting. There would not be any wars. There would not be any bickering. I think there's a lot of truth to that. My job is to try to teach others. But you'd be surprised how much I get to learn from y'all and I get to benefit from y'all. And particularly young people, small children. They teach us many valuable lessons. And we're going to cover five things that this king did that are very remarkable. But before we begin, let's just say he did what Solomon said to do in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1. And it's something that I want us all to remember as well. Remember now the Creator in the days of thy youth. People can and they have made a big difference and their acts have taught many lessons. And those in high positions, no doubt, the things that they do will have effect on others. Keep in mind, here's not only a young man, but he's a king now. And his decision is going to have an effect on other people. But the things that he does pleases God. And as a result, it's going to have a positive effect on others. Think of David when you look at First Samuel 17. How he goes and slays the giant Goliath. Think of Daniel who refuses to bow down to the king and worship false gods. And as a result, he's put in the lion's den. Think of Timothy, how Paul has taken him under his wing, and he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, Let no man despise our youth. And think of the influence that Timothy has. Think, while we're at it, go into Genesis 22. Abraham, while he's told to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice, Abraham's faith is confirmed, but... I think we would do well to point out that Isaac was a willing participant too in doing this, and I think he was a man who has reached the age of accountability, but he's still a young person at this time. And I think with him doing his part as well as Abraham doing his part, you have that beautiful picture right there displayed. Think of Jesus. Oh, yes. We know that he only lived to be 33 years, of, uh, 33 years of age. And we know the last three years of his ministry. But think for a minute when you go into Luke chapter 2 and verse 49 through 52, how when he's 12 years old, he's going into the temple, and the people are astonished at what he knows. They're astonished at his wisdom, and he grows, and he continues to grow. So a young person... Don't let anybody despise you because you're young. And at the same time, older people, let us appreciate their wisdom as well. Let's not despise them as well. But here's a young man, Josiah. And before we get into this lesson, keep in mind that he is making a choice. And we all have a choice to make. He either accept him or deny him. Matthew 12 and verse 30. Christianity is not something that we can force on other people. We don't cram it down somebody's throat. We don't coerce them. We give them the choice. Yes, there's consequences if we don't obey God, but at the same time, He has created us as free moral agents to whether we will accept him or deny him. We make that choice. It's kind of, if you've been ever, I know you all haven't been around me very long, but I've used this illustration before. You know when an election takes place, you go into that voting booth, 
you make the choice who you're going to vote for? Let's stop and think for a second. You're walking into the voting booth of life. Here's somebody who is so evil, he doesn't love you, he doesn't care what you do. He wants your soul to spend eternity with him. He'll deceive you in every which way he can. John 8 and verse 44. He's the father of all lies. He's crafty. He's going to make something look good on the surface when it's not good. He'll tempt you in every way. But on the other hand, here's somebody who loves you. Who gave his life for you. Who cares for you, 1 Peter 5, 7. Who died for you. But here's where you come in. Remember, I just introduced both. One on this side and one on this side. Now you come into that voting booth, you get to cast the deciding ballot of who you get to serve, of who you will serve. We all have the choice who we will serve. Here a young man is king, and his actions help a nation return to God. That is a hero. Doesn't always have to be some sports star. Doesn't always have to be some mega millionaire or somebody else that we may hear in the news on the front page of the newspapers. But here's a hero. Because he returns a nation back to God. That's a true hero. No matter what age you are. No matter what gender you are. No matter what classification you are in intellectually or economically. Here's a hero to you. Here's someone who can be a hero to you. Josiah. Look if you will in 2 Kings chapter 22. And we'll see in verse 2 of 2 Kings 22. Here this young man is balanced. If somebody is chemically imbalanced, do we try to encourage that person to get some kind of help? If they're mentally imbalanced, do we encourage that person to sometimes get the help that they need? But what about somebody who is spiritually imbalanced? One will go way to the right, to the right extreme. He's going to bind things that his own opinion on people. He may come with the haughty spirit and the haughty attitude. Oh, it may not be what he said, but it's a manner that he said something. Or here on this side, you have one who is so loose and everything. Very carefree. I don't know what that's like. I was young at one time. Here, yes, I was young. My daughter's nodding her head no. I was young, believe it or not. That was a hundred years ago, but still. But here, somebody who loosens what, think, what God is not loosened, takes liberties and crosses those boundaries of liberties that he or she shouldn't do. But notice what it says about Josiah. He didn't go to the right and he didn't go to the left. The same thing that is said in Jeremiah, or rather in Joshua 1 and verse 7. Also in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 32, not to go to the right or to the left. But Solomon would say in Proverbs 14 verse 1, a false balance is an abomination unto God. And to show what a picture of balance should be, Look in Ephesians 4 and verse 15. Speaking the truth in love. Back it up in one verse, in verse 14. Not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15. Speak the truth, absolutely, but it better be done in love. I've known brethren who will go into one extreme or to the other extreme so many times. We need to have that love and compassion toward other people. And yet at the same time, we need to have those convictions and not compromise God's word. There's the balance that he's talking about. 
So first of all, what can we say about King Josiah? He pleased God. Not just because he was young, but he pleased God. You know how he loves the little children of the world. We sing that song, the words are so true. When we look in Matthew 19, what Jesus says, how if we tempt a child to do wrong, how that's an abomination on him. Do not cause the little children to stumble. He's not only pleasing God because he's a young person, but notice by what he did. And how he walked. When you get into public office, you get so much under the microscope. People will know what you do. We know some of the we know the value of the person in office, what he or she believes or does not do. And we're going through trying times in our nation. I'm not making a political statement. But we're going through, our country's in a disarray. An election is coming to place. And it's amazing how much mudslinging goes on between the candidates. If you're like me, you don't look forward to commercials from a political candidate. It doesn't matter whether it's a local candidate or somebody on the national scene. You cannot wait till election is over so you don't have to see those commercials anymore. Let me put it in perspective for you. Those are the kind of commercials that you don't want to remember on a Super Bowl uh, Sunday type of deal. You can guarantee they will not be paying big bucks to advertise themselves. Okay? Now you got what I'm saying. There's all that mudslinging seeing how much dirt they can get on them. But have you ever noticed these people don't usually tell you what is best for the country? And they can tell what their opponent did while they were in political power, but they can't tell you what they can do to help us out of some of the problems. You ever notice that none of these candidates will tell you To be a successful nation, you have to go back to God's word. Could it be because if they said that, they would lose votes? Josiah pleased God by what he did and that he walked with God. God noticed it. And if he noticed it, That tells me that you and I are not just another number to God. In fact, Jesus would say in Matthew 10 and verse 30, even the very hairs on our head are numbered. You're not just another number. But he notices the good things that mankind does. And he noticed what Josiah did. In fact, just the opposite When you look at the first sin in Genesis 3, didn't Adam, to put it in perspective, didn't Adam try to hide from God? And when you look at Hebrews 4 and verse 13, how what we did will be noticed by God, will be exposed to God? I've done some dumb things in my life, believe it or not. I've, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I may have been in tongue-in-cheek a little bit at the start of the lesson, but I'm not in tongue-in-cheek when I say You'd be surprised how many people, when I go preach at a congregation, literally know one of my relatives or one of my siblings or knew my parents. Or... When you're a small kid in school, you have a teacher that is not a member of the church, but later they moved away and got converted. It's happened to me twice running into somebody I had in elementary school. How do you think it feels to hear, you're a preacher? You actually grew up? Yeah, it makes you feel about that tall because, I mean, I did some dumb 
I'm not going to tell you the dumb things I did. But I did some dumb things. Funny thing about it is I had older siblings and they got in trouble for doing some of the, the stuff and dummy me did the same stuff that they did. You would have thought I would have learned, but I guess I didn't. Things get exposed. God notices what we do. But what else? He's balanced man in verse 2. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And walked in all the ways of his father David, and he did not turn to uh, turn aside to the right hand or to the left. He is balanced. But notice, he did was right in the sight of the Lord. The question is, who are we trying to please? And we can ask that question from many different angles. Preachers need to ask themselves that question. Who are you trying to please? Are you trying to please God? Or are you trying to please men by bringing down a watered down message? In our daily lives, who are we trying to please? Are we trying to please our friends or our relatives by denying what Christ says in Luke 14? And it all goes back to Galatians 1 and verse 10. Paul would say, Who Am I trying to please men or God? Galatians 1 and verse 10. And if Paul asks that question, we certainly should ask ourselves that question as well. But what else do we notice about him? Look in 2 Kings 22 and begin in verse 11. All the way down through verse 13. We see he respects the word of God. Not only is he trying to please God, but he respects the Word of God. Why do I bring that up? Isn't it true that some will try to separate one from the other? They do it with Christ. Give me the man, but don't give me the plan. And divorce one from the other would do great harm. He respects the Word of God. Notice, if you will, in verse 11. It happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes, which was an Old Testament custom. They didn't like the way they were living, and so they rent their garments. And that was a way of saying, I'm going to come back to God. I'm going to get rid of these things that are distracting to me, or distracting to God. You see, he respected God's word. In fact, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, Paul says that all scripture is inspired of God. Stop for a second. Go back in his early life in Acts chapter 9. Keep in mind, this is after Christ has already fulfilled the old law. Didn't Paul one time just want to strive to keep the old law alive so to say but he had to be taught by Ananias and even Christ saying why are you persecuting me and Paul now says guess what all scripture even that that one time I denied guess what it's inspired of God's So all scripture is inspired of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. But, notice, when the king heard the words of the book, and then verse 13, go inquire of the Lord for me, or verse 12, then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Akbor, the son of Micaiah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, the servant of the king, saying, Go inquire the Lord for me, for the people, and for all Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning this. He 
has acknowledged the previous generations were not loyal to the word of God. Now, one thing I want you to do. He acknowledged it because it was evident. He's not trying to blame his own problem on somebody else. Why do I say that? A lot of times, when we've done something wrong and we get caught, what do we try to do? Do we want to blame somebody, the other person? Isn't that what Adam tried to do in Genesis 3? God, I wouldn't have sinned if you didn't give me this woman who you gave. Uh Uh-uh. That don't cut it. You're just as responsible as she is for what you did. You made the choice, Adam. And on the day of judgment, isn't it true that many are going to try to blame God in Matthew 7, beginning in verse 22? But God, I didn't know. God, you didn't explain it in full detail. Good luck saying that. I may have told you all one time, not only have I preached full time, uh, did full time preaching, and I've been preaching 25 years, but I've also worked in juvenile corrections. What I'm about to tell you, will you please brace yourself? In the state of Texas, when a youth breaks the law, he can be incarcerated in a juvenile prison from the age of 10 to 18. Once in a while, there are those exceptions. We had a kid who was eight years old in for armed robbery. I kid you not. And that kid had a mouth on him. Guess what? He's now a grown man serving him because his sentence carried over. One thing that we tried to do is they had to give their life story before they are released. Which basically is the thinking errors that they used. What led them to do that crime? And what is their success plan to not do a crime again? We drill them hard. Time after time after time, I have heard one kid always, more than one kid, blame somebody else for what they did. Very rarely does a kid start out saying, I made a choice, I messed up. Very rarely. If some of you have ever taught in public schools, you'll know that's a prevalent problem. But he pushed me. He did this. Some of the things we as parents go through I'll have you know, I didn't have gray hair before I became a parent. But anyway, he made me do this. He made me do that. I guess the dumbest excuse I ever heard was one kid saying, the judge didn't know what he was doing. He made a mistake. I'm incarcerated. You really expect me to believe that? Josiah has acknowledged what they did. He's not trying to blame the previous generation, but he's saying, guess what? I'm just as guilty too for sinning. So here's God's law. Here, let us return back to God's law. Isaiah 8 and verse 20. You see, God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. But he determined not to be like that previous generation. We seem to face two extremes in our nation. And I guess it's gone on in every generation, but, and I'm not trying to be mean or unkind with what I'm saying, but keep in mind, I grew up with an older generation. My dad would be 90, as I said. So I grew up with that generation in many ways. I remember when I was little, they blaming the younger generation, the baby boomers who grew up in the 60s who were always rebelling. And I remember hearing people my sibling's age 
blaming the older generation. But Josiah said, guess what? We've all sinned, no matter the previous generation and even my generation. He determined not to be like them. But we face a problem a lot of times where people will not respect the wisdom of the previous generation. We think that they do not, did not know anything. And yet we also face a problem a lot of times from the older generation. Well, they're a bunch of kids. What do they know? They're not any good. Uh-uh. That is not just, that's not accurate either. Every generation is going to have somebody who's going to do something bad, and every generation is going to have somebody who does something good. I'm not one of these preachers who's going to go making fun and tearing down what the older generation did, what older preachers did. And yet at the same time, I'm not going to look down my nose at somebody who's younger who's preaching, who may be inexperienced. We need to appreciate each other and learn to work with each other, and Josiah is doing that. Keep in mind, while this is taking place, instead of following a trend, he is setting a trend, rather. Can't that be said of Christ? Because after all, you had the Pharisees and the Sadducees both who were mad at Him because He was not on their side. Guess what? He wasn't trying to take man's side or be in some clique. But He was trying to fulfill God's Word. We see how He knew the law. He respected the law. But at the same time, He wasn't trying to be in a clique of men either. Instead of being a following a trend of what the Jews were doing at that time, Jesus himself was a trendsetter. And I guess of all the places that really has displayed that self to me, look in genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 of him. Some of those relatives that he had, his some of the ancestors that he had were some rough characters. They had baggage. But you know what? He was determined, not because he was related to somebody to do good, but in spite of who he was related to. Now carry it down to us. He didn't love us because of who we are, but in spite of who we are. In spite of who we are. You see, we make the choice. We do not have to behave like people before us did. Talking about an older generation on my mom's side, she had an aunt who grew up in the Corsicana area, a little town called Eureka. And for those of you who are wondering where Eureka is, that's on Highway 287 going from Corsicana to Palestine. I mentioned to you that my mom grew up with Larry Hagman, who played JRU. My aunt literally went to elementary school with Clyde Barrow. That's why I said I might be going in the witness protection program because y'all might not like me because of who some of my relatives knew grew up. But anyway, that was a generation or two before me. What do I learn? I don't have to act like them because of what they did. And Josiah is saying the same thing. I don't have to act like the people before me having all these idols, doing all this vain worship and ungodly things. I don't have to be like them. Instead, he respected God's word. In Psalm 119 and verse 10, Through our precepts do I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. We can see, Oh, how I love thy law, Psalm 119 and verse 97. It is our meditation all day long. He would know that God's word would convert the soul, Psalm 19 and verse 7. He would know what Solomon would say. In Proverbs 30 and verse 5 and 6, every word of the Lord is true. Do not add to or take away from it lest it be found a liar. 
He would have the attitude that Ezekiel would have in Ezekiel 3 3, where Ezekiel took a copy of God's Word and ate it. Guess what? It was sweet unto his soul. He respected God's Word. The lesson will be yours in just a moment. Notice, though, he humbles himself to God. Look, if you will, in verse 19. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse. And you tore your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. He humbled himself to God. Why is it a lot of times the main problem that we'll see in a lot of marriages I've had to counsel a few people before. Or why is it a lot of times a man might be struggling in his spirituality and he's not sure? It's usually because that man does not empty himself completely. To take on Christ We have to humble ourselves and empty ourselves. Take up your cross daily and follow after me, Luke 9 and verse 23. But as that song says, a lot of times we want some of self and some of thee. And that's not a good combination. Why is it sometimes we'll see some of the arguing, bickering going on between brethren? Could it be sometimes egos are at stake? Or even in a marriage? Sometimes egos are at stake. Rather than emptying ourselves and respecting what the other person is like. He humbled himself. He was willing to empty himself. And it's awesome on that. Because keep in mind, he's a king, he's a ruler. It's awesome to see a king or a ruler with no ego in the way. There's an old saying, when that ego goes up, that power goes down. I have the utmost respect for law enforcement. And I'm not, if you're law enforcement, God bless you, I appreciate you. But I think we can all come in agreement. Sometimes we'll see someone who wears a badge might let it go to his head to a certain extent. The ego might get in his way. He might have the attitude, my way or the highway. That don't help at all. Doesn't help either in a marriage. My parents would be married 64 years. They were married 63 years before Mom passed away in 2012. Eight months to the day, Dad passed away. Dad would say it in tongue and cheek, and I did not realize until years later the wisdom that he had. He always said he made the major decisions, Mom made the other decisions, but he said nothing major ever came up. So he didn't have to make major decisions. The team. What about the ruler of the nation? When he's willing to let his ego go, it's go. When he's willing to get rid of that ego. Pride goes before destruction, but a haughty spirit before fall. Proverbs 16 and verse 18. And again, I'm not making a political speech. Don't take it like that. But Wouldn't it be neat if some of the political leaders would understand that what they're doing is supposed to be public service, and yet they're thinking of more of the career ladder of how I can climb that career ladder of political success? Forgetting about the constituents, but thinking more of themselves. He turned his heart toward God. And his heart was not a gross heart in Matthew 13 and verse 15. But 
but his heart served God. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23 and verse 7. He was willing to empty himself. Luke 9, 23. If anyone thinks that he can stand, let him take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. If we think that we're so high and mighty, be careful, we're going to fall. Don't go thinking of yourself up here and others way down there. A lot of times mankind will do that to others. Our job as Christians is not to try to run over and belittle those that are on the outside, but try to bring them to Christ. And if a brother is weak, try to build that brother up in love. That should be our goal. Try to restore that brother. Get rid of the ego. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Romans 12 and verse 3. And in the previous verse and 2, he said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, and not to think more highly of yourself than what you ought to think. It's amazing to see the pro athletes who get these big salaries forget the reason why they went into sports in the first place, to have fun. Like what we try to teach our children. The ego comes into place. And it rules that person. And it ruins that person. Or in the go into the job market, into the you get that big promotion. Then you get those other promotions. And somehow we think that we're above everybody else. Oh, you have different responsibilities than that somebody else. But you're not doesn't mean that you're automatically better than that somebody else. We see it all the time about us. He makes that commitment. Look in verse 3 of 2 Kings 23, then the lesson will be yours. His covenant he makes with God. He makes a commitment. And isn't that what God wants us to do? Christ wants us to make that commitment. Don't just say that you're going to serve me, but do it. Make it a lifetime commitment. The bride and the groom that are united in marriage, that commitment with each other. We're here, Christ being the groom, us being a part of the bride, we make that commitment to Him, that we will serve Him. And Josiah is making a commitment in verse 3. He stood by a pillar, he made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and keep His commandments. Noble words, but those are more than just words. They become an action. They become his lifestyle. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. You see, Christianity is not just like a coat that you put on the coat rack, but it's something that should describe us every day, all the time. He made that commitment to keep God's commandments. Jesus would say in John 14 and verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And flip those numbers around in John, in John 15, 14, you are my friend if you keep my commandments. But look what he said in 1 John 5, 3. His commandments are not burdensome. They're not grievous. But his commandments are a guide to us to keep us safe. Josiah realizes that. What is the greatest commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and the second one is like this. Unto this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39. The first one, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul. Josiah is willing to do that. He's making that commitment in 2 Kings 23 and verse 3. And as a result, the influence that he has on his constituents, on the people... The people followed the king's example. That young man. Remember a while ago I said, young people, you can make a difference. Y'all teach us lessons too. Valuable lessons. I've been very blessed. Very fortunate. 
I don't do full time preaching. I fill in, and I've been at a lot of places this year, the last several years. My calendar has been filled up, and I've been blessed on that. But some of those places, you'd be surprised. A month ago, at a congregation, probably one of the best opening prayers I've ever, ever heard in my life by a young 14-year-old kid. Like y'all, real polite, real knowledgeable. You make an impression on me. You made a good, positive impression. I'm proud of y'all. Every other month, I'm in a place many of y'all may have heard of. It. Scurry, Texas. Not scary, Texas, but scurry, Texas. Which is between Ennis, where I live, and Kaufman on Highway 34. That's a small congregation, but there are two kids there that sit on the front row real shy. But two of the greatest kids I've ever met in my life. Their parents were sick one time. They came to services all by themselves. They made that choice. They do a lot of little things around that congregation. Some of the upkeep that they do, they choose to do it. No one has told them to do it, they choose to do it. They make a difference in people's lives. And Josiah is doing that as well. The people followed the king's example, the young man, because he knew that his actions would have an effect on others. He was willing to remove the things that would distract attention to God. Idols are torn down. They're getting rid of the ungodly priest. And he has an ungodly priest put away. When we look in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 5 and 6, 2 Kings 23, verse 17 through 19, he's saying these things are not worth it. God's Word had an effect on him. But as a result, he is striving for purity. In Psalm 12 and verse 6. Young people, think of the influence that you have when you say, you know what, these worldly things are not worth it. They're not worth it. The worldly things he got rid of, those idols, those pillars. And the evil priests, they were executed in verse 20 of 2 Kings 23. Saying, you know what, I don't, we don't need these immoral people about us, around us. Evil companionship corrupts good morals. But they had their consequence. There are consequences of sin, and they paid for it. Josiah said, I'm going to stay with God's word. And likewise, you can do the same things all throughout your life. Stay with God's word. There, this lessons come about. One who stays with God's word, one who humbles himself to God, one who respects the word, and one who respects God Almighty. Don't let anybody despise you because you're young. Let us understand that whether we're young or old, we need to be with each other. Lie on each other to realize that we serve the same Christ. Let us realize it. Let us humble ourselves upon the Lord. You've heard the message in Romans 10, verse 17. Again, I don't know your heart, I don't know where you stand. I'm not here all the time. Do you believe that God's Jesus Christ is God's Son? God ain't verse 24. That belief leads you to do something. Are you willing to repent of your wrongs? Luke 13, 3, Luke 13, 5. I didn't say, are you willing to say you're sorry? Well, acknowledgement is a good part of it. Are you willing to stop doing what is wrong and start doing what is right? Here was a man who said, wait a minute, this isn't working, this isn't right. This keeps us separated from God. Let's do something about it. Can you say the same thing? Let me do something about it. 
in the right way to please God. Are you willing to not reach you to confess that Jesus Christ is God? Some man can be a person. Are you willing to make that confession to a man's time? And be buried with him, but don't stop at this confession of something. Are you willing to be buried with him in baptism? Only six, three, four, Acts 2, 38. For the remission of your sins. To where you become a child of God. Guess what? The older people here, those that are already known, they love you. They will encourage you. They will help you. And you likewise will help them to grow as well. Perhaps there is someone here who is not yet an infested Christian. Take those steps. But maybe there is someone here who is a child of God, but you straight away. You love your first love, Revelation 2, verse 2. Why not come back to them? Be restored. Say, you know what? I have a good life. I followed through on my commitment. Now I'm coming back while oh, there's still time. Again, if you fall in that category, guess what? Folks here, they love you. They'll help you with that. We help each other on our journey so that we can all get that reward together. We help each other on that journey. Will you come as a given sense?